What's up, YouTube? Today I'm going to talk about the language of creation. So this video today is going to be inspired by this book that I've been reading, Language of Creation. I'll leave a link in the description to it below. And it's also inspired by uh, a lecture by Jonathan Pajot, uh, who I've talked about multiple times. And so I'll leave a link to his lecture also in the description. Uh, and so this book, it's actually created by his brother. Uh, I don't know exactly how to pronounce that. I'm just going to say Matthew. It's French Matthew, it's something like Matthew. Check out the book, it's a great book. I'm going to break it into kind of two parts. I'm going to talk about language generally and how we understand what language is. And then I'm going to talk about the creation story, so the first chapter of the Bible, and try to understand it, except in a new light. Try to get out what is the meaning behind the structure and the words of the first story of the Bible. All right, so I first want to begin with language. Here I show this image, and on the bottom is just marks on a page. And then the row above that, I've assembled those marks into an alphabet, arranged in a particular order, and then, you know, since you know English, you'll, you'll see that it's the wrong order, and I rearrange them into the correct order above, right? Now, I want to ask you, what is true? What is real? What is the real thing going on here? And what I mean by that is, is it, is it real that these are just marks on a page, or is actually what's real the meaning behind the marks on the page, right? Is it the word meaning, or is it what meaning represents the concept? What I would say is both are real. Right? And it's, it's important to remember this, right? And we talk about more generally with the Bible, it's kind of like seeing marks on a page as the literal interpretation, and then understanding the concept behind the marks on the page, or understanding the concept of meaning, that's also a form of real. This is like a symbolic understanding. But there's two kinds of real here. There's literally, it's marks on a page, and then symbolically, what it represents. It represents a concept that's behind the words. Now I want to do the same exercise, but in Arabic. And you see here, marks on a page. You're going to assemble the marks into an alphabet in the second row. And then the top row is a word, concept. Right? But if you don't know Arabic like me, you don't see the concept behind the marks on the page. And so all I see is marks on a page, and there's no difference between these three. They're the same thing. And what I want to say is, it's because I don't know the language. If I don't know the language, all I see is marks on a page. All I see is the literal interpretation of that is just marks on a page. I don't see the meaning behind the marks on a page, and I want to emphasize that point. And I'm going to try to show you, in the book of Genesis, the meaning behind the words. So to start, I'm going to go through the first chapter of Genesis, but I'm going to show you there's patterns that are emerging in it. And so it starts with, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the surface of the deep. I want to talk about the word form and the word void. So form, I want you to think of platonic form. So it's the essence of a thing. Or it's the ideal of the thing. That's what's meant by form. So in the beginning, there was no meaning to things. There was no ideal form of things. And then void means it was empty. So there was no things, and there was no ideal of things. And then there's this other symbolism that we're going to see repeating. And it was like, God created the heaven above and the earth below. Right? So this is in the beginning. Now on day one, he says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. So again, we have this above and below symbolism emerging. We have earth. And then we have above and below, light and darkness. Right? And so we see this pattern. This pattern is going to be repetitive. It's going to keep happening over and over, this above and below idea. But then also, God saw that the light was good. So it's defining the light as good. And he separated the light from the darkness. So there was darkness, and now what's important also to remember is that the darkness came first. It was the earth was dark. It was formless and void, and then God spoke into being light, and he separated the light from the darkness, but it emerged out of the darkness. Right? That, that's an important thing to keep in mind. All right, now on day two, then God said, let there be a space between the waters, to separate the waters of the heaven from the waters of the earth. And that is what happened. God made this space to separate the waters of the earth from the waters of the heavens, and God called the space sky. The gist of day two, again, is that earth below is split into sky above and water below. Right? And so this above and below pattern is seen again here in day two. And it's going to be a repetitive theme. And then in day three, it's the same idea. God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let the dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas. God saw that it was good. So again, the water below was split into land above and sea below. And so another thing to notice, from day one to day three, it's getting more and more specific. And if you go backwards from day three to day one, it's getting more and more abstract. Day one was just light and dark. 
Day two is sky and water. And then day three is more specific with land and sea. And so there's this zooming out and zooming in idea that's happening from day one to day three. And, and day one to three, I, I want to separate this. This is going to have a somewhat different feel to it than days four, five, and six. All right, and so for the rest of this, I'm, I'm not going to read all the passages for the sake of time. All right, on day four, now there's a general pattern that is happening when he's talking about all the days. And it says, and God said blank, and then God made blank, and then he judged blank to be good. And it, that's kind of the pattern of all the days. It's always in some form like this, right? And so I'm going to emit the full passage. You can read the Bible if you want to see it. And in day four, he created the sun and the moon, right? And then also in these days, he often is giving a purpose to the thing he creates. He gave a sun and the moon, and God set them in the firmament of heavens to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. Now you see it's referencing to day one. Day four is referencing to day one. That's important. We're going to see this pattern again of the later three days referencing the first three days. Okay? And then again, the sky is split to sun above and moon below. But what's important here is this above and below pattern is also present in heaven, in the sky. In what's above, there's also this above and below pattern. And this is, this is going to turn out to be like a fractal pattern. It's a continuous above and below Splitting as you get more and more specific versus more and more abstract in the opposite direction. Day 5 says, and God said blank, God created blank, and God saw this was good. And the blank here for day 5 is birds and fish. Right? And so again, birds are above, fish are below. You know, and you could ask, why did he make birds and fish on the same day? What's the relationship there? And the relationship there is to create this above and below pattern. There's this constant repeating above and below pattern that keeps emerging here. And then the, the purpose that he gives to the birds and fish is he says, And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. So what he's saying is, let the birds and the fish multiply and reproduce and become abundant, abundantly present in the sky above and the waters below. All right, now day six, this is kind of like the last day. Again, you know, and God said, and God made, and God saw that it was good. That same repetitive pattern keeps happening here. So, so the idea is this is actually how you experience things. When I interact with the world, like right here, I look at this, and I say cup. I might just say it in my head, but I say cup. I see it's a cup. Then I look at it, and I say, oh, this coffee's been here for a month, and it's all moldy. That's bad. I judge it. Or I could say, and this is the actual case, you know, it's like this is fresh coffee, and it's good. And you do this. You automatically, you already do this when you interact with the world. You see something, you identify it, you name it, you say what it is, and then you judge it. Is it good or bad? This is how you interact with the world, right? And then you say it's good, and then I can drink the coffee. So it's it's describing actually how you interact with the world. Like this this pattern that's repetitive in creation is the pattern of how you engage in the world. Right? And so, okay, on day six, he created the livestock and the creeping things. Again, above and below. And creeping things, you know, I mean, it's, it's something like caterpillars and scorpions and things that, you know, lie in the ground, underneath, below, below the surface, and the livestock is above the surface. And also there's this relation to livestock. They're, they're closer to us. Like, they're almost an extension of our society, the livestock, right? So we have, you know, horses and cattle and sheep and things like that that are integrated into our society. Okay, and so then also on day six, and this is kind of like the, you know, the punchline of the creation story. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So again, you have man, and think of man in the Bible as human. It's male and female together. And then there's a splitting into male above and female below. Again, you have this above and below pattern. Right? And don't think of above as better and below as worse. That's not the symbolism here. Above is heaven. It's the like the abstract ideas, and below is the embodiment of it. It's like spirit and body. That's the idea. Right. And then, so, this is important, God. God it, this tells us our role in the world, and says he created God in his own image. Right? But then, his own image was described in days 1 through 5, and we'll come back to that. And then he also said, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, 
Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And so there's two words here, subdue and dominion. These are not submit and domination, right? And if you see it as submit and domination, you poor soul, who hurt you, right? It's not, that's, it's not the idea of the, the Bible. It's not, oh, go there and conquer and, you know, make everything your bitch. It's like, that's not the idea here. Subdue, like, look at the word. Sub is under, and do is like due process, right? So what this is, is, you know, yeah, we are the apex predator, but that endows us with a responsibility to govern over the world and have it in a just way. That's what subdue is. And to have dominion over all the animals, right? It doesn't mean dominate them. Like, if you're a parent, you have dominion over your kid. And hopefully, if you're not pathological, you don't dominate your kid. You care for them, right? And that's what this means. Form a loving relationship with the world around you. All right, and I want to come back to this idea of created in his own image. Also, what does that mean? What that means is we're the ones, we're the mediators between heaven and earth, right? We are the ones that go into the darkness and extract the light, right? That's our role, and that's what we do, and we know that's what we do, right? Like, and so this isn't a prescription. This is a description, right? It's telling us what we already know. It's not telling you you ought to do this. This is what we're doing. Look at science. What is science trying to do? It's going into the unknown, the dark, and it's trying to extract out what is true, the light. This is the hero's journey. This is the hero's journey that Joseph Campbell talks about. You plunge into the uncertainty of the darkness, and you extract out the light. And you use that to make your world better. Right? That's the story in Genesis, and this is setting up the stage. If you take these fractal patterns that I've been showing on every page, where it's one thing splits into two above and below, you get this pattern. And this, the idea is, you know, God created heaven and earth, and then earth splits into sky and water, and the sky splits into sun and moon, the water splits into land and sea, and then the birds and the fish are created, and then there's man. Right? So the idea is you have this above heaven and below earth. Right? And heaven is something like heaven, light, spirit, and bottom is earth, dark, body. And it's not good and bad. Not this. This is a relationship between the articulation above, trying to understand the form of things, trying to understand the purpose of things above, and trying to understand, and, and then acting it out and embodying it below. That's this duality. And that's humans. That's what we do. We act in the world, and we abstractly articulate the world. And then the articulation tells us how to act in the world, and then we update our articulation of the world. And there's this constant back and forth between heaven and earth. And man is the mediator between heaven and earth. That is our role. Okay? That, that's what the Bible is saying. And what I'm saying is this is a description of what is already true. You already know this, but you might not have articulated it this way. Right? And, and this is what Genesis is saying. Okay, and so this came out of the New Living Translation Bible. So there's an image of the six days arranged in a particular pattern. And I like this, and so it puts day one, two, and three on the left, four, five, six on the right, and then the beginning is above, and the ending is below. And so in the beginning, everything was formless and empty, right? And then day one, there was light and dark, day two, water and sky, day three, sea and land. And it's getting more and more formed as you go down from day one to day three. And if you go up, it's more and more abstract. And then the same thing on the right, you have, now we're filling the world. So first he's describing the form of things, and then on the right, four, five, and six, he's populating the world. So for day four, we've got the sun, the moon, and the stars, and it's related to day one of light and dark, because the sun and moon define light and dark for us. The sun gives us light, and the moon defines darkness. And then in day five, it's related to day two. So day two, we had water and sky, and then now it's populated with a body of birds and fish. And then day three is sea and land, and day six it's populated with the body of animals and humans. Right? And so there's this cosmic pattern here that's emerging. And it's saying there's a form to things, and then there's a body to things. There's a spirit of things and a body of things. And this is the idea. And the things can be more abstract, light and dark, and more specific, sea land. 
or human, right? And and so that like like Genesis is articulating that. Another thing, here's a passage from the next chapter of Genesis. It says, These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created. And the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God, Lord God has not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. And so the important part here is this says that man must come before plants. That's not the pattern in Genesis 1. Right? So what it's saying is the literal interpretation is not the correct way to view this. Right? That is not the point of Genesis 1. It's not the, the point of it is not to take it literally. Right? And when you look at Genesis 1, on day 3 came the plants, and day 4 came the sun. That's not possible. But then, that, that's not the point. The pattern that I'm showing to you is the point of Genesis 1. Right? And this is a message to the creationists that are, for whatever reason, somehow trying to pick out the exact date that God did such and such thing on day three or four or whatever. It's nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. And then to the atheist, that's not the correct way to look at it. There's a meaning behind the structure of Genesis 1. Right? And that's what you get at. What I want to say is this meaning behind the words is real. It's a different kind of real. Right? It's, it's describing reality itself to you. I want to end on this symbol here. And so this is called the Stamheim Missile. German icon, and then I want to zoom in on the center part, and this is actually Jonathan Peugeot's symbol for his YouTube channel, The Symbolic World, and this symbol, I think, is a great way to capture Genesis, and so if you look at it, it shows the six days, starts in the top left with Let There Be Light, and then it goes clockwise through all the days, and now if you look, day one and four are across from each other, and they're the same thing, but day one is the form of it, it's the spirit and day four is the body. And day two is the spirit. And day five is the body. Day three is the spirit. Day six is the body. The idea is you have this above and below pattern. Again, you have the spirit above and the body below. And it's the same thing. So in day one, you have light and dark. Then you have sun and moon. You have sky and water. You have birds and fish. You have uh, land and sea. And then you have all the animals. And then coming out of six is us in the center and what this symbolizes is we have the heaven above and the earth below, and we are in the center. We are the mediators between heaven and earth. And Genesis is it's setting up the stage to understand the human story, the story of you. It's in placing you in this cosmos, in this cosmic narrative, and it gives you the role and says that you are the mediator between heaven and earth. You are the one who goes into darkness and extracts the light. Uh, and if you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't like the video, feel free to give it a thumbs down. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know your thoughts on this. Do you think that this is an appropriate reading of Genesis? Have you heard this before? Is this new? Make sure to talk to me down in the comments below. I try to answer every comment. Uh, and make sure to like and subscribe. And click the bell icon to stay up to date. Uh, if you like this kind of content. And until next time, take care.